Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. On September 11, 2001, terrorists struck the World Trade Center, resulting in the deaths of thousands of Americans. This attack challenged the way we celebrate our fundamental freedoms here in America. One month later, the Acton Institute had its 11th annual anniversary dinner. The dinner featured a keynote address by journalist and political commentator Tony Snow, as well as comments by Father Robert Sirico. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as find previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash actonvault. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act and Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. How many times in the past month have we been struck by the expansive scope and seemingly endless depth of evil? In the midst of something so heinous, so diabolical, can the hand of the one whose finger is said to write straight with crooked lines be detected? As the stories of the orphans and their grief-stricken families are told and retold, whether in our national media or in our kitchens, there is lurking in each telling and retelling the ominous question underneath it all, why? Not that a simple and straightforward declaration from heaven itself would heal the wounds that we bear. Yet the question of why evil exists is one that weighs heavy on many hearts these days. No full answer in the form of a sentence or a proposition could ever satisfy the question, even if it were to drop from the sky. For the ultimate answer, which does come to us from heaven itself, comes not in the form of words, but a word, or more specifically, the word who was made flesh. That final answer is not a proposition, but a person. And the embrace of one whose comfort is beyond our present understanding. The ultimate answer then is a mystery, the mystery of encounter and the mystery of embrace. Now having said that the ultimate answer is a mystery does not mean that there are no proximate answers to the question of the existence of evil. And among the proximate answers is the fact that human freedom, so highly prized by all people, all civilized people, is also at the heart of evil. In a world whose history is so frequently acquainted with totalitarian experiments, one would be tempted to think that freedom, standing alone, was its own good. Yet to see the heart of darkness as the world saw it on September 11th, is to understand that mere men, for certain twisted reasons, chose to exercise their free will to destroy the freedom and the lives of others. Thus freedom, as indispensable as it is, is not sufficient for constructing the quality of society and culture appropriate to man to his dignity, and to his awesome capacities. Rather, it must be a freedom oriented to something beyond itself, as we at the Acton Institute have said so many, many times, oriented to the truth, the truth of man's origin, the truth of man's nature, and the truth of man's destiny. That is why the Acton Institute was founded, and why its mission 
is to study and promote both the transcendental reality of man and his necessary freedom. Or as we put it, to study religion and liberty, or the free and virtuous society. A clear understanding of the relationship, the proper relationship between religion and society has never been more needed in our world than it is today. The events of September 11th have revealed a dimension about American society that some have attempted to shield from our view. We have discovered or rediscovered that at its core, America is a profoundly religious nation and that faith is not a source of division among Americans, but rather the foundation of our unity based on shared principles. In addition, Americans have rediscovered that when we all, including our political leaders, speak openly about our faith, it doesn't violate anyone's conscience, much less shred the Constitution, as so many pressure groups have argued in the past. Rather, it gives rise to reflection on America's highest and noblest aspirations. We have found that the love of freedom and the embrace of faith are not incompatible. Instead, they are bound up together with one another, each reinforcing each other in perfect harmony. To that extent, we can hope that the last four weeks represents a sea change in the way our society views the place of religion. There wasn't a public figure who addressed the attack on our nation who did not also include a plea for prayer. Many referred to the religious roots of the Western idea of human rights, one of the things so antithetical to the terrorist's conception of man. Many public spokesmen, including the president, sought God's blessing on our people and the aspirations of our nation. Prayer vigils have been held continuously. Indeed, we can't even imagine dealing with a crisis of this proportion without our faith. In a moving meditation, President Bush at the National Cathedral in Washington expressed a vigorous faith. He said, and I quote, as we have been assured, and then he quotes, neither death nor life, angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth can separate us from God's love. Then he said, may he bless the souls of the departed, may he comfort our own, May he always guide our country. But I wonder, had the president made these same remarks one week earlier, would there have been an outcry from the ACLU? As there was during the election when he shared his faith experience with some prayer groups? Might he have been called a theocrat, or worse? As it is, his unabashed faith, relentless during the presidential campaign, is now seen as a great sign of his leadership, and indeed it is. How tragic that a calamity on the scale of what we saw on September 11th had to impart this message to reveal the religious truth beneath the secular pretensions. But there is even more going on here. As a nation, we have always grounded our belief in human rights in a fundamentally religious idea. Human life is sacred because it has its origin in the eternity of God's grace as well as in the destiny of his love. 
It is because human beings are created in the imago dei, the image of God, that we know that the heinous actions of diabolical fanatics are crimes of such eternal magnitude. From the Declaration of Independence through to the Civil Rights Movement, faith has been at the core of every event of importance in our history. Usually that faith is invoked in defense of the sanctity and dignity of the human person and against those who would violate it. And this is as it should be. As for those who hate modern life, modern life made possible by this conception of the human person, the choice of the World Trade Center, symbol of global free markets, was no accident. If one hates human life, one also hates the products of human creativity and the process of it. And hence, what better target could have been selected? And yet these terrorist attacks differ merely in kind and degree, but not in principle, from those who are also behind the violent demonstrations and riots that we have witnessed against globalization in Seattle, Washington, Montreal, and Genoa. These are the irrational cries of the forces of repression and darkness and bondage that hate and fear human liberty, human enterprise, modernity, and ultimately human life itself. Thankfully, such forces are doomed to failure because the logic of their culture of death leads to self-immolation and destruction, whereas the logic of a rich and healthy culture of life leads to replenishment, creativity, and growth. This, then, becomes the challenge of the post-September 11th world. Will we come to see our successes, our prosperity, our creativity, and our liberty as all being a means to a higher end? Will the awareness of our transcendental reality form our day-to-day -day decisions and our path as a nation? And especially from the perspective of the Acton Institute, so concerned as we are about cultivating a religious leadership that comprehends the moral potential of human liberty and enterprise, the question becomes for us, are our clergy prepared to speak in so intelligent, bold, and confident a manner that will invite the spiritual and moral renaissance our society so desperately is for. It is a common, commonly held view that faith is somehow less necessary in times of peace, prosperity, and security, and that living in a society of plenty diminishes the longing for spiritual solace. We know from our own experience that we are more likely to turn to God in difficult times than easy ones. God speaks to us with a megaphone in our pain, C.S. Lewis says, because it is then that we reach the end of our rope, not when we feel ourselves to be masters of the universe, then that we are most likely to fall upon our knees in supplication. My pastoral experience suggests that personal trial is a prime motivating source to seek spiritual comfort and the forgiveness of sin. At the same time, it is an error, and perhaps the fundamental error of the terrorists, to believe that faith and prosperity are always inversely related. Part of the challenge of living a life of faith is to maintain a certain spiritual equilibrium in good times and in bad not to be tossed about by the winds of circumstance, flitting between bouts of depravity and sanctity, but rather seeking devotion as a daily practice. One can hope that there is no going back on our newfound tolerance for open expressions of faith. Let us hope that the abiding smirk has been permanently wiped off the faces of the cynics 
who have too long occupied too central a place in our culture. May we continue to regard faith as a source of strength, comfort, and blessing to us as individuals and to our nation. May it be the source and the summit of our freedom, its barometer and its compass, even once our sense of security returns. And let us pray that it returns soon. God bless you and God bless America. What I'm going to do, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, I've struggled diligently and tried to write out a serious speech tonight. I almost never do that sort of thing, but it's, a, it's an interesting time in our history, and this is the kind of forum where I want to try my hand at saying serious things, so I will beg your indulgence as I do this. But I want to talk a little bit about, not only about what has happened since September 12th, but why it is that the American character has expressed itself in such a way since then. How is it that we drew out of our inner reserves a decency that has surprised and heartened us all? So I'm going to do a little march through history, and trust me, I'm going to sort of fake my way through this. I'm going to toss out some pages of the speech, because I did this grand historical sweep. And if we do this, you're going to have to be carted out of here tonight. And I don't... <laughs> But originally, you know, originally we had come up with some, some speech titles, you know, In God We Trust or something. And I was going to make fun of Gary Condit. You know, I was going to talk about, you know, the, the lack of values and virtues in Washington. But that doesn't work anymore. I don't give a rip about Gary Condit. In fact, I don't give a rip about a lot of that stuff anymore. Most of us don't. But what I do want to take is the core of the original suggested title, In God We Trust. And I want to focus on the words God and trust and try to discuss how, in fact, they do work in tandem to create the basis of liberty. Because I do think that the slaughter of innocents in Washington and New York has invested the terms God and trust with a kind of piquancy that we perhaps didn't appreciate before. We have been awakened to the reality and power of evil. Now, you're going to hear that word a lot. Father Sirico used it, and I'm going to use it a lot, because that's what we are seeing, and it's something we are unaccustomed to seeing. But we also now have an opportunity, an extraordinary, rare, and precious opportunity to reclaim not only the idealism, but the sense of purpose and mission and decency and fulfillment we had as a young nation, because we're young again in very strange ways. Now, in order to get to the point, I'm going to walk you through some things. We all know about America's unique origins. It's not a land that was built on conquest or lust for land. It was built on an idea. Our founders believed that it was, the idea was virtuous liberty, not liberty itself, not liberty untethered. The idea of virtuous liberty was very important. The founders thought a lot about virtue. They talked about it. They understood that it was impossible to maintain a republic of liberty without a common creed. For them, there was no liberty without virtue, and there was no virtue without liberty. Now, it's easy to see how they reached the conclusion. They reached it because liberty is not merely the ability to, to do what you want. It also requires a certain amount of predictability. You have to know what somebody else is going to do. You have to know there are ground rules. Now, there are some pretty obvious examples of this. We drive on the right. It's not optional which side you drive on. A well-ordered society relies on routines. We all have routines. We need them. If not for customs, we'd live in utter chaos. However, and we wouldn't be able to take small things for granted, and this is how you get to the issue of trust. If you could not take for granted the fact that you can trust your neighbor to a certain extent, if you could not take these things for granted, you would spend all of your time watching your back, wasting time scheming either to avoid attack from somebody else or plotting an attack of your own. And that is how you get the Hobbesian society in which the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. You need the predictability. You need trust. What happens when you have a society without trust? Well, consult your recent memories. I will turn you to the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was a place where the truth had no role. Remember how the big lie 
was one of the key methods of trying to inculcate everybody in the evils of Western society. But there were also small lies. It was lies from the bottom to the top in the communist world. People lied about whether they showed up for work. They lied about their production quotas. They believed the big lie that they were living in the best of times and the most virtuous of societies. And they filled out paperwork to that effect. And everybody consented to the common lie. But in the end, a society that tried to maintain its hold on people through the use of terror collapsed for the simple reason that there were not enough cops to watch 200 million people, each and every one of whom was yearning to be free in their own ways. Now, it was a peculiar thing, too. The communism had sapped people of basic ambitions. I remember once I was in a, a collective farm. It was out in the Ukraine, I think, or somewhere out in that region. And it was toward the end of the Soviet Empire, and I was talking to somebody who was running, and I said, well, don't you want to be free? And I figured somebody said, oh, yes, we would like to be free. But no. This guy looks at me in a face not only quizzical, but a total shock. And he said, why, why would I want to be free? The state, it gives me my food for free. The state, it gives me my home. It gives me my education. It gives me my clothes. If I have freedom, who gives me these things? That sort of sense was gone. But at the same time, and this is one of the, this is one of the, the most striking features. I used to go to the Soviet Union. When I went to Washington, it seemed natural to go to the Soviet Union every once in a while to compare notes. <laughs> and so every year I would go, and you would see in little places people hunkered down having religious services. It was a wondrous thing that in a time of oppression and as, of course, the end became near, people began to flock to churches and be more open about their faith. Not long ago, I was reading a story. Somebody, I guess, was in the Andes a couple of years ago. They found this, this fellow who had been frozen. I forget which mountain range it was. But they found a frozen guy who was very well preserved. And among his effects was a little leather sack. And you know what he kept in that leather pouch? He kept an ember. An ember, a wonderful thing. Imagine this, prehistoric man walking around a little ember, knowing that at any given time in the coldest winter, the darkest night, somehow he could use that ember to light a blaze to keep him alive and others alive. He carried that ember. The ember in the Soviet Union was religion. And for all those years, it was kept in the pouch, and yet somehow it, it brought those people through. It may and someday may someday become the, the device by which the Russians still overcome a thousand years of envy and personal animosity. But the religious faith was an extraordinary thing. Now, the United States has avoided that kind of a fate, that kind of despotism, because our forefathers really did think about trust, and they thought about its origins. Think about our currency. What does it say? It says, in God we trust. That's a pretty clear statement of theology. People have tried to get it broomed off the, the currency, but it hasn't worked. Why? Because it expresses something that lies at the core of every American heart. It, a realization, however dim, that the rights we have do not come from Thomas Jefferson. They don't, come from, they don't come from any of the founding fathers. They come from God. And in God we trust because the source of our rights and our truth and our morality are not of human origin but of divine origin. And that is, I'll tell you, that it sounds like a, a geeky point. You, you need to understand how important this is. If you rely on your fellow man to be the creator and arbiter of what's right and wrong, well, just look at the people next to you. <laughs> you really want them making the big decisions? <laughs> the fact is, morality, right and wrong, good and evil, are facts. They are moral facts. C.S. Lewis made this point brilliantly. They are facts. They are every bit as factual as this, as the laws of science. And the moment you start to think that, no, 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 they're contingent, we can make them up, then you invite chaos. And that is what we've gotten in many points in our history. This is called natural law theory. Go back to the Declaration of Independence. It's very clear. All men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Doesn't say that they are endowed by whoever is in power in Washington at the time. We don't have the luxury of making up our right and wrong. Go back to the story of Adam and Eve. God was not afraid that Adam and Eve would discover right and wrong. He was afraid that they would discover moral arrogance. 
And that's what created the fall. It wasn't the knowledge of right and wrong. It was the illusion that we could define it. So they ate the apple and we elected Clinton. I have to remember that one. <laughs> now, the founders were ambitious men, but they were not fools. They understood human nature even with all this highfalutin talk of what we Catholics call natural law theory. The fact is that they had a very clear understanding of human nature. In fact, Federalist One, the very first of the Federalist Papers, reminds readers that even the very best people in the colonies at those times, the people standing up most forthrightly for freedom, would sometimes pursue their goals out of, quote, ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these. <laughs> you know, trust but verify. They understood this. They understood human nature. It's difficult to understand at this point the sheer audacity of the founders of the United States of America because we now take for granted our affluence. But they looked around. They didn't see great cities. They didn't see the kind of transport that was available in Europe. You know what they saw? They saw forests choked with undergrowth. They saw wild, inhospitable mountain ranges. They saw rivers filled with unseen obstacles. They'd try to go down the river, wham, they'd run into something. But they also had the imagination to envision, envision fertile fields, and they knew that in this country, this place that they had come to settle, at least they would not be bound by old animosities or borders disputes. They had room to stretch. Our founder's combination of natural piety and unbounded ambition could have produced a deeply schizophrenic society, but it didn't. In a lot of places, you can have faith and wealth only by gluing them together through hypocrisy. Not true in the United States. Ours is, fact, ours is the only land where affluence did not automatically create indifference or class resentment. The sociologist Max Weber noted this some time ago when he talked about the Protestant work ethic. Now, from the earliest days to the present day here in America, we've all considered labor, labor a noble undertaking, an homage to our maker, a duty to our families. And it's why, despite our affluence and power, we are more industrious than any people on the planet. But also, what other country would come up with a phrase, work ethic? <laughs> the French? <laughs> It's just impossible to express exactly what this inborn ethic means. When the Great Depression crashed in upon the United States, what happened? Did our streets go aflame and rioting? No. That's the amazing thing. During the time of the Great Depression, there were occasional labor disputes, and you would see labor rights. You saw those all over the world. But normally what you saw were people trying to be neighbors. Buddy, can you spare a dime? And maybe the most impressive and fascinating phenomenon during the Depression was the 1939 World's Fair in New York. David Galerner's written a, well, part of it's wonderful, part of it's boring, but it's a good book on it. <laughs> and it's about the 1939's World's Fair. Now think about this. It's the middle of the Depression, and in New York City, they're holding a World's Fair about the brilliant future. They envision flying cars and huge cities and, and technologies that will allow you to do all your work. And I mean, just this amazing future. People flock to it. They went there day after day and then returned to their empty pantries. Why? Why did they do that? Because even in this time of unparalleled want and deprivation in our country, there was still the lingering hope that in America, the only thing that mattered is you came up with the right idea and you worked hard and you made it happen. That's an amazing thing. I mean, we often think about the reserves we have as a society. I'm, I'm rehearsing this simply to explain to each and one of, every one of us, maybe even to myself, why it is we have responded so splendidly to the present difficulties. We've always believed ourselves a force for the good. Again, this was a nation where when somebody in the early years, somebody would move into the neighborhood, which would be a patch of wilderness, people would help them raise a house. In the Great Depression, you still had charities. We're the most charitable nation on earth. We give. We think it's important. Well, I was on the streets of Washington on the 11th of September. I was supposed to do Rush Limbaugh's show that day. So 
I got out of the office and I had to walk because you know what? I had to go from one part of Washington to another, about two miles apart. And the streets were completely jammed with traffic. The cars just packed up one by one. And the thing I noticed immediately is how quiet it was. Nobody was honking their horns. Nobody was yelling. There were a couple of drug dealers. I saw a couple of drug dealers yelling at each other. But in a, a two-mile walk in packed traffic at a time when people were still worried. At this very hour, they were worried that a jet was going to come in and hit the Capitol building. It was on the radios. There was panic everywhere. That's why they were in their cars. All these people sitting in their cars are listening to a radio. They're wondering what the hell's going on. Sorry. They want to be with their loved ones. They don't want to be here stuck on the streets of Washington. But they were polite. They were roll People in the cars were rolling down the windows so that we on the streets could hear the latest news. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And at one point, the first jet fighters started coming over. You recall, after they finally got all the jets down, they started running Air Force jets or some kind of jets up and down the Potomac to protect the Capitol. And the very first one of those that came along, I'll never forget it. We're all walking down the street, and suddenly we hear the sound of a jet. Keep in mind what we've been hearing on the radio. Everybody froze. We're looking up through the jagged patches of sky that are visible through the buildings. We can't see anything. But in time, the jet sound passes, and we heave a sigh of relief when we go along our way. But people, at a time when there should have been widespread panic, were nice. How cool is that? I mean, you, you know, usually you think when there's, when there's going to be a tragedy, it's like Godzilla in Tokyo. <laughs> People are running all over each other, but there was none of that. You saw little acts of play, no, before you, as if it mattered. You know, the cars weren't moving anyway. But that, to me, I think, told me maybe more about the native decency of Americans. Our natural impulse wasn't to push or shove, but to work together. Okay, now... I've talked a little bit about faith. Look, let's, let's understand that religion is always easy to pray for hucksters. We know that. We've had plenty of hucksters in our time. Every, and the other problem is that every passing generation tries in some ways to appropriate religion to justify the latest political urgency. So when we talk about religion, we do have to be realistic about its possible abuses. Nevertheless, it's interesting that in American history, until very recently, public figures at least felt compelled to be hypocritical when it came to matters of religion. Sam Rayburn, I think it was Sam Rayburn, had the old adage, never trust a man who cheats on his wife. <laughs> Ladies, check those gentlemen who just chuckled. <laughs> it didn't used to be a laughing matter. This is, of course, before Clinton and all that, but on the other hand, there was at least a certain presumption that even though members of Congress are still wilding and being terrible people, they at least publicly would maintain the fiction that they believed in the upright and the good because that was important. That was an important part of our glue. They did not think it was dispensable simply because a public opinion poll told them otherwise. You know, what's happened in recent years is we've done everything we could to, to, to have religion without having God. It's like being a Unitarian. A friend of mine once described a Unitarian as a guy who worships cardigan sweaters. <laughs> but it's a peculiar thing that in the United States, the courts from 1962 on decided that the most dangerous thing that could happen in public, that somebody mentioned the name of God. <gasps> For Bill Clinton, God was the word that in the presidential oath preceded the even more important, that was right before the even more important word, me. <laughs> the, Bill Clinton was a guy who had the, the audacity, I don't know if, know if you recall this, but right after all the impeachment stuff, he went out and, and after he confessed, uh, I had a relationship with that woman. <laughs> he went out and he misquoted the 51st Psalm, a psalm of contrition, and he suckered a bunch of religious men. I mean, this is a guy for whom all of these things were manipulated cynically. And we thought for a while, okay, we can do with that. But we can't. We've learned. And why? Our, our founders understood this better than we. I mean, Thomas Jefferson realized that the moral sense was innate to us all and was fundamental to freedom. He wrote something called A Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom. I'll read you a section of it. He said, religious liberties are of the natural rights of mankind and that if any act shall be hereafter passed to repeal the present or narrow its operation, that is the Bill of Religious Liberty, it will be an infringement on natural right. Now you've got to understand, 
This guy was anti-clerical. I mean, this is a guy who said there would never have been an infidel if there, that we, well, I'll read it. There would never have been an infidel if there had never been a priest. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> but of the moral sense, he said, it is the brightest gem with which the human character is studded and the want of it is more degrading than the most hideous of bodily deformities. I was going to quote Tocqueville a lot. I'll spare you that. He knew. But we have what I call a, a, a paradox of secularism in this country. You see, we decided not to have a state religion, but we did decide to protect religion so that people would be able freely and in their own ways to acknowledge those moral truths that I mentioned earlier and to realize that they're the foundation for any kind of civilization that ultimately can rest on trust and therefore create the conditions in which we can have some happiness. We don't spend all our time watching our backs. We have a soul. We're unlike a lot of nations. We have a soul. The paradox of secularism, you can trace to another, I'm stealing from C.S. Lewis again. He once noted that a number of the great religions at least share the basics about the, the you know, a belief in divinity and how you treat one another. He called it the Tao. That's T-A-O, it's not a stock market thing. Um, you know, if you want a quick summary, the Ten Commandments of the Golden Rule will do. But the fact is, we embrace those standards. Now, in the United States, again, I'll give you another example. Tom Brokaw once talked about the greatest generation. He didn't talk about it. He wrote about it. He wrote a great book about it. The people who were reared in the Depression and fought the Second World War, the greatest generation. Why? Because when faced with evil, they did what was right. They didn't have a choice, of course, but they did it, and they had the tools available. They had the decency. They had the dignity. They had the determination. I mean, that's an astonishing thing. We went halfway across the world, or a quarter way across the world, and we sacrificed blood and treasure, and we kept the world free. We believed in national destiny. I mentioned that World's Fair before. But we have always seen ourselves as a people of action guided by destiny and by the hand of God. That in itself, again, is pretty extraordinary. Think of the people who came to settle America. What were they? They were scoff laws, and they were paintings in the neck. They are people who basically got kicked out because they were always complaining about something. America was, you know what America was? It was populated by the people who sat in the back of class. <laughs> and yet there was something about the experiment that took all these people who sat in the back of the class, who always took the risk that nobody wanted, and they did astonishing things. Okay, so now we get to the present day. We've forgotten all of this. We've forgotten all the things that led up to this before September 11th. And then in one searing moment, we were reminded of what mattered. What was the first thing that came through your mind when you thought of this? You probably thought of the horror, and then you thought, what about my family? And then what did you think about? You thought about good and evil. I mean, for years and years, it simply was not, and nobody used, when Ronald Reagan talked about the evil empire, people went nuts. How dare he call it evil? The palpability of good and evil, these are things that matter. They have moral bearing. They're going to have a big influence over our lives. At the funeral of my friend Barbara Olson, uh, the homily delivered by Father McAfee, he talked brilliantly about the difference between good and evil. And he said, evil is nothing. It is sheer nothing. We saw in the men who, who flew jets into occupied buildings absolute nothingness. They may have thought they were praising Allah, but what regard did they have the people next to them? Nothing. No regard for the dignity of human life. Now, it's been a long time since we really thought about that. We've never had to think about these kinds of situations. And our lexicon, especially in terms of diplomatic terms, is, has absolutely nothing to deal with these situations. But this is where the president's treatment of the issue has been fascinating. What word has the president used consistently to describe it? Evil. Again, you know, Reagan had done people go nuts, but George W. Bush, somehow it's working this time because it's a real thing. Evil, evil, evil. He has said, this is, not a this is not a fight against American interests. This is not Jim Baker talking about oil. It is a fight about fundamentally what is right and wrong. Now, this rhetoric has several striking advantages. Number one, it has established a very clear benchmark by which to judge this president. Let me talk a little bit. This is not going to be so much religious as strategic for a minute, about what is going on in this war effort. OK, 
because it is a war, but it's a peculiar one. Number one, sooner or later we're going to take out the Taliban. And it's probably going to be sooner, but I don't know. I don't want to presume to, to know what the military planners are doing. But it's incumbent upon us to remove the people who have been supporting the bad guys. And in addition, Osama bin Laden in the cells. If you know anything about the Middle East, you also know that if the United States does not take pretty good steady aim at Iraq, nobody's going to take this seriously. You see, in time, you have to persuade people. And this is one of the reasons why Osama bin Laden's been having such a good time. He figured, hey, he knocks off the U.S., he knocks off a couple embassies. The only thing Bill Clinton does is, to quote President Bush, fire a $2 million rocket into a $10 ton and hit a camel in the butt. We are going to have to give a few people some sphincter tightening terror when it comes to <laughs> the business of supporting murder as a political weapon. And I think you will see, actually, you're going to have to see something going on with Iraq and Syria, Iran, and all the other bad guys are going to have to, to mind their manners. Here at home, we are likely to see a few, we've seen a few small ero eruptions of pacifism, but most of it's been of the, yeah, well, National Review Online calls it Kumbaya Watch. Um, it's the sort of thing that would be nice if people weren't people. If, you know, if there were Ken and Barbie dolls and you could make them be nice. But when you have motivated people who, who want to do terrible things. The other thing you've seen in response to this, I'm happy to say from a number of Catholic clerics, is the explanation of just war theory which has been indirectly uh, advocated or at least supported by the Vatican in this case, which again is different than previous conflicts. The Pope was not too happy about the Gulf War, the war in Bosnia, the war in Kosovo. This time it's different, folks. This time it's different. Now one of the de defining characteristics of Osama bin Laden's Islam is the fact that even though Islam is a warrior's faith, it, you know, Muhammad was a man who not only sat in a cave and received visions from Allah over 22 or 23 years, but over time he conquered land. And part of the Quran talks about conquest. It is the rare religion, it, it, like, you know what it is, it's guy's religion in many senses, because, <laughs> no, uh, it is. It's in the sense that it marries this notion of, of sort of holy crusade with war, with fighting, with, with conquest. And what has happened in the present day is that some of the principles of Islam, which led in its early centuries to spectacular success in terms of learning and the arts and wealth, they have all been now subordinated in the person of Osama bin Laden, but also a frightening number of clerics around the world to simple envy. It's hard to elevate that to the level of religious principle, but it's envy. They envy us. They don't like the fact that we're getting ahead and they're not. This is a very crass and, and short ex explanation, but Osama bin Laden has done what demagogues do. He finds a bunch of losers who are unhappy, and he tells them that if they follow him, that they will become saints, and they believe it. He has married Islam to Marxism, basically. And so that is the challenge that we all face. Now, American religious tradition there's a couple of answers for this, and I'm going to speed up here because I want to wrap it up and, and get to the stirring finish. <laughs> here in America, as I mentioned before, we have this tradition of understanding that you can pursue prosperity without necessarily going straight to hell. You, you have other things that, that you can contribute to. There are a number of things that you can do, but in America, over the centuries, we have venerated people of achievement, the men of commerce. And that is a good thing. Instead, what you have now in Islam, as far as I can tell with Osama bin Laden, is a cult of poverty. Poverty being a good thing, wealth being a bad thing. I don't know about you, but I figured out which side I, I like. <laughs> and I dare say the rest of the world has pretty much too, but we're going to have to fight for it. And that is something that we find very peculiar. Let me just very quickly run through a couple of the things that I think the September 11th attacks have destroyed. Because it's fascinating. Number one is it has destroyed latter-day liberalism. 
there was a presumption throughout the 60s that you could get rid of God because you had really smart people in Washington and they were the same thing. <laughs> and it, it would be even more laughable if it weren't so true. But the fact is that, you know, this whole notion of government compassion was try to find some sort of cuddly surrogate for the religion they had driven out. I always ask this question when I talk about government compassion. I'll try you out. Because I love the notion of government compassion. When is the last time anybody here walked into the Department of Motor Vehicles and felt the love? <laughs> Just checking. The whole enterprise of liberalism, which basically presumed that people were stupid and government was smart rather than the other way around, was not only naive but bad. And you look at the failure of the welfare state, that becomes manifest. And so now there is a possibility, and believe me, I don't necessarily, I'm not telling you that George W. Bush is going to make government smaller. Government almost never gets smaller in times of war. But there is still an opportunity now to revive the notion of human dignity, and the heart of the notion of human dignity is the belief that people can do things. <laughs> All right, another victim, demagoguery. Demagoguery has sort of lost its cachet. Jesse Jackson has gone away. We can go on. I mean, you know. <laughs> Al Sharpton, <laughs> the ACLU. Yeah, the ACLU the, uh, the other day, I think, did get involved in one of these silly lawsuits about the Pledge of Allegiance or God Bless America or something. But it's interesting to see that all of these movements that were based on trying to reverse our natural sense of right and wrong, now we just say, you know what, you tried to talk us into it, it sounded kind of good once, but please shut up. <laughs> this, is the, the, this is where the guy in the back of the class has had enough. <laughs> Speaking of which, I cannot tell you what a delight it is to see students right, standing up and jeering idiotic professors. Because you know, look, why do we go to college? Simple answer, because we're stupid. <laughs> we go to college because we're stupid and we, we, we want to learn how to learn. But there is a generation of professors who went to school in the 60s and 70s who stopped learning. They figured that what they thought at the age of 24 was truth. I don't know what happens to people. I don't know what I can say to people like that. I mean, changing diapers, you would think, would help people wake up. But <laughs> because over time, we get experiences. We learn to, to sort of throw out beliefs and ambitions and things that don't make any sense for us anymore. We develop a certain core of humility. But you, you see professors standing up and repeating this Maoist bilge. And like I said, it's great to see the students get up and jeer. You have absurd situations in Berkeley, California. In Ber Berkeley, California, the city council forbade the, the fire department for putting stickers on the fire trucks. You know why? They were afraid that when the firemen pulled up to a fire with that, that flag attached to them, that the fire truck itself would be attacked by peace advocates. Madison, Wisconsin, the city council has outlawed the Pledge of Allegiance because they don't want under God. I'm not even going to go for the cheap one on that one. All of these things are going away because something has been rekindled. I want to, well, I want to finish up by quoting something that I came across the other day. Um, Oriana Falacci is sort of the Barbara Walters of Italy. She does all these globe-trotting celebrity interviews, but she has chosen to live where? In the United States. And she did a long dispatch on what happened after September 11th. I'm going to read you part of it. She, she went to ground zero, and here's what she wrote. All of them, young people, little kids, the old and the middle-aged, white, black, yellow, brown, purple. Did you see them or not? 
While Bush thanked them, they waved the American flags, raised their clenched fists, and roared, USA, USA, USA. In a totalitarian country, I would have thought, but look at how well the powerful have organized them. In America, no. In America, you don't organize these things, especially in a cynical metropolis like New York. New York workers are tough guys and freer than the wind. These guys even disobey their trade unions. <laughs> but if you touch the flag, you touch the country. America, she continued, is a special country, my dear friend, a country to envy of which to be jealous. And it is that way because it is born of a spiritual necessity and the most sublime human idea, the idea of liberty, or better, liberty married to the idea of equality. We are rediscovering what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, but let's understand that we need to be a little sober as we think about it. In recent years, we thought wars are kind of cool things. They're high tech, they're like video games. They come, they go, they last a couple of months, nobody gets hurt. People have already been hurt and people are likely to get hurt. I mean, we've, most of us have heard about the, the bizarre announcement from the FBI that something bad's gonna happen in the next day or two, they just don't know what. But you find in times of conflict, there's always this gush of initial optimism and it's almost always wrong. Ulysses Grant at the beginning of the Civil War, I remember, urged the generals to give him a lot of troops so he could sweep down and conquer the Mississippi and end the war quickly. And they said, I don't need to do this. And as a result, the war was extended by a good two years. Abraham Lincoln, at the end of his first inaugural, closed this way. He said, we are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. That's beautiful. It's lyrical. Mystic cords of memory. I've never figured out what it meant, but I say it all the time. <laughs> but then you get to the second inaugural. This is after a war has taken place. The poetry is there, but the tone is much altered. The very end of it, and you know the paragraph, the final paragraph, the closing peroration. With malice toward none, with charity toward all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. It gets concrete now. To bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow, and for his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a, ju cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. This is, going to be, this is going to be one of those times that tries men's souls. But I think we have found that if, again, we get back to the basics, God, trust, freedom, we have the basis not merely to win a war, but to win a society. See, this is a time where hope really ought to flourish. We should not allow ourselves to become captive of our fears because if we do that, we not, I don't care about losing to Osama bin Laden. I don't want my children to wake up scared. I want them to wake up, as Father Sirico did, and as saying thanks. Because you look out in the glorious day here in, in western Michigan, you, the leaves have already turned here, and it's, it's splendid. You go out in the morning and there's beauty everywhere, beauty that's incomprehensible. It speaks to you in ways that you can't say. Embrace it all. Understand how important it is. Because that is the sort of thing we need to cherish. The ability to say thank you and to acknowledge the extraordinary gifts and blessings we have is the most important thing we can give to our children. Because if they understand the blessings, they'll know how to build on them. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.